ejercicio político de la emergencia del conocimiento y fomentar Okay, well, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, is it on now? Yes. Okay. So, the title of my talk this is Big Science and Its Early Modern History. So, on the morning of the 22nd of August, 1766, a Royal Navy frigate, the Dolphin, which you see here, commanded by Captain Samuel Wallace up there, sailed out of Plymouth in Southern England, ostensibly bound for the Falkland Islands in the, in the Southern Atlantic, uh, Las Mal Malvinas, yeah. Uh, she was closely followed by a considerably smaller swallow a 25-year-old derelict sloop commanded by a veteran, global uh, a veteran of global circumnavigation, Captain Philip Carteret. In reality, the two-ship fleet was Britain's latest attempt to sail to the Antipodes in search of the ever-elusive southern continent, which, although its dimensions had in reality uh, sorry, um, uh, its, its dimensions had shrunk considerably since its representation in Ortelius's Mapmont of 1570. So you see, uh, this is the Terra Australis below. And by um, 1754, it had shrunk. So this is the theoretical size of what they were looking for. But it continued to reign as one of the most resilient beliefs in the whole history of exploration. However, just before leaving the Straits of Magellan, uh, at the entrance into the Pacific, the ships lost each other and had to complete their voyages independently. Neither of them found the Southern continent, but in the course of his travels, Wallace was to discover the largest of the society islands, Tahiti, and claim it for Britain, as his secret instructions from the Admiralty had desired of him. Wallace landed in the dunes in Southern England in May, 1768, after having successfully sailed around the world in under two years. Meanwhile, in the face of severe storms and a scurvy-stricken crew, Carteret had successfully managed to keep his listing old tub afloat and actually sail across the Pacific. In the course of his crossing, he had discovered or rediscovered a number of islands, notably the Solomon Islands, correctly plotting their bearings on his map. He had also identified a number of islands which might serve as way stations for ships to refresh and refit. On the 3rd of June, 1768, so that's two years after he left, he sailed into the Dutch East India Company port of Batavia. So, which is here in now Indonesia. It's what we now call Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. Where he, his severely battered swallow was repaired, recorked, and restaffed. He was still forced to spend another six weeks 
in the Cape of Good Hope to refresh his crew before setting out on the final leg of the Atl up the Atlantic back to England in early January 1769. At daybreak on the 19th of February, Tartaret and his crew spotted a French frigate astern making towards them at good speed. So these are the two ships and these are the drawings of the period. By the next morning, the French frigate had joined them and a dandily dressed Frenchman came on board the Swallow to ask if they required any assistance. So these are the two men, the ships are together. Displaying a surprising foreknowledge of his name, itinerary, and misfortunes, the visitor informed a greatly surprised Carteret that the dolphin had already reached England and that his own ship had been assumed wrecked before besetting him with a series of very probing questions about the details of his route and discoveries. His suspicions aroused by his, and I quote Carteret, he says, by the artful attempt to draw me into a breach of my obligation to secrecy, Gottfried responded hedgily before politely ushering his visitor out of his cabin. The Frenchman, who lied about the nature of his own voyage, passing himself off as an East India man on his way back home from Sumatra, was none other than Louis Antoine de Bougainville. Uh, well, this is how he was painted, but this is how he wanted to see himself. <laughs> so also on his way, he was also on his way home after circumnavigating the globe, close on the heels of Carteret. He was following Carteret all along. At ports along the way, he had learned a good deal about Carteret's expedition and since sailing out from Batavia, had been trying to catch up with the swallow so that he might glean additional information. Before leaving Carteret, Bougainville compared notes on their bearings and found that the formers were off by about 10 leagues to the west. He also made sure to take letters with him, which he posted to Carteret's family, informing them of the, of the well being of the ship and of its captain. This was the first report concerning the swallow to reach Europe since. Wallace, Wallace's return the previous year. In his own diary, Bougainville noted, the ship was very small and went very ill. And when we took leave of him, that is of Carteret, he, rema he remained as it were at anchor. How much he must have suffered with so bad a vessel may well be conceived. So this is Bougainville. Meanwhile, on deck, the sailors of the two ships, although officially sworn to secrecy, freely exchanged tidings and learned of each other's experiences and exploits on their three-year-long journey. It was through the crew that Carteret learned of the true nature of Bougainville's mission, but too late to confront the latter who had by then in uh, Carteret's own words, shot by as if we had been at anchor. In his own diary, of course, yeah, this is what uh, Bougainville had already said. So, let's just look at this. So, curtsy, cooperation, national interest, competition, espionage. These are five terms that actually characterize this little encounter and the whole experience around it. So Cartwright's mission and extraordinary mid-Atlantic encounter with Bougainville neatly captures some of the central characteristics of the Pacific voyages of the second half of the 18th century that made up 
what has come to be known as the second great age of European exploration. These hugely expensive ventures spread over the entire globe required a large number of technicians and seamen to get a small number of adventurers and men of science to distant places, mobilized large corporate trading groups, private and government institutions, including learned societies, and men and resources of many European countries and their overseas outposts. The knowledge produced was cumulative in character and guided by political direction. The actors involved had a strong sense of objectives, an evaluation of risk, an expectation of reward, and a sense of teamwork and hierarchy. In short, a configuration that bears a closer resemblance to the big science of the second half of the 20th century than to the free-minded, autonomous, gentlemanly practices that are so commonly associated with the scientific ethos of the 18th century. So, big science. So, when history, so let's, this term is in fact, was in fact in, uh, coined in 1961 by Alvin Weinberg in an article which, which was published in Science, which is called The Impact of Large Scale Science on the United States. Of course, I mean, as usual, you know, it's the only thing that matters, <laughs> the United States. Uh, after that, it's left to everyone else to do what they like with it. So in this, Weinberg says, sorry, and this is the article. He says, when history looks at the 20th century, she will see science and technology as its theme. She will find in the monuments of big science, with a capital B and a capital S, the huge rockets, the high energy accelerators, the high flux research reactors, symbol of our times, just as surely as she finds in Notre Dame, a symbol of the Middle Ages. And this term is taken over very, very, very quickly within a year by an historian and sociologist of science, Derek de Sola Price, in a book which is in fact a landmark of the field, Little Science, Big Science. Uh, published in the, by the by Columbia University Press in '63, it's a series of lectures. In fact, that the Solar Price gave in '62, and this is the foundation of scientometrics, of the measure of science, and that's where he makes this distinction. So, in this, he says, big science is so different from the former state of affairs that is, little science that we can look back, perhaps nostalgically, at the little science that was once our way of life. So, now, although no single definition will do, but as a first approximation, one can say that a science becomes big when its funding levels become non-negligible on the scale of national economics. In addition to big budgets, this implies big laboratories, big machines, big staffing. So it is then a complex interplay between, on the one hand, its outside links, that is the outside links of big science to the state, to industrial capital, and to the military. And its inside organization is hierarchies, competition, and collaboration. So, and of course, this theme has been taken up a lot in our field, in the history of science and in science studies. Here is a classic book, Big Science, well, edited by Peter Gallison and Bruce Heavily. Big science, the growth of large-scale research, 
sorry, I've written it twice. Uh, ignore it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and another book which takes up this idea, uh, which is not an edited book. In fact, it's a commonly authored book by five people, by Michael Gibbons, by Camille Limoges, Helga Novotny, Simon Schwarzman, Peter Scott, and Martin Tro. And it's called The New Production of Knowledge, The Dynamics of Science and Research in Contemporary Societies. Now in this, the authors put forward a dual mode model, I mean, a dual mode of scientific production. So when they say the new production, there is an old production of knowledge, which they call mode one. And mode one is characterized by academic, disciplinary, autonomous research. Whereas from the middle half, from the mid 20th century, according to them, the mode changes. So this corresponds to the shift, uh, the so-called shift between little science and big science. So mode two, you can translate as big science and that they characterize as transdisciplinary, collaborative research to work on specific problems for application. It has a heterogeneous and organizational diversity. It is socially accountable. And its origins are of course in the mid 20th century. Now, if most historians no longer recount it in heroic terms, so these, these uh, Pacific voyages, we come back now to the Pacific voyages because I just wanted to give you some idea of what we mean when we talk about big science. Since I mentioned the term, I said, okay, this resembles big science in the 18th century. So what is big science? Now let's come back again to the Pacific discoveries. And if most historians no longer recount this, this history in heroic terms, some nevertheless continue to focus on heroic figures like Bougainville, Cook, and La Pérouse, and their acclaimed naturalists, the naturalists who go with them. To be sure, mention is made of the material and political conditions as a background before concentrating on the scientific contributions proper, analyzed along the thematic axes of geography, navigation, natural history, medicine, and anthropology, which are taken to circulate freely in, a, in the cosmopolitan and idyllic republic of letters, also within inverted commas. That is the way in which we understand this period. And these words are always used, you know, these, this is cosmopolitanism, this is the Republic of Letters, there's a free exchange of knowledge. Now, although the Pacific, where is, now what I want to question in this talk is when we actually look into the details, this is a myth. There's something else is happening over here. And so, this becomes the background for, for some people. You know, what I want to talk about is then the background. But science is autonomous. So this can be the, the general conditions. This is what's going on in the world. But scientists still live and talk and communicate freely. <coughs> they work for the sake of knowledge. Of course, there are others who, in fact, take the opposite position and say that everything is economically determined. But then, they, but then knowledge doesn't matter. You know, it's just that you have an economic determinant and that makes you produce knowledge full stop. There's no interaction. Now, I want to actually go back to the Pacific and see what's really happening. So although the Pacific had been opened up to European navigation during the 16th century in the wake of the Hispano Portuguese competitive rush to discover new lands and routes to the spice-rich East Indies. So if you remember Magellan, uh, amongst others. 
uh, many of the new islands thereby discovered could not be located again by successive expeditions for want of rigorous and standardized procedures for taking bearing measurements. For instance, the Solomon Islands, discovered by the, by the Spanish navigator Mendania de Neira in uh, 1568, could not be sighted again for nearly two centuries owing to imprecise bearings. It was not until the progressive entry of Holland, England, and France into the lucrative business of trade with the East uh, following the eclipse of the Iberian Golden Age Pacific exploration began in right earnest. These explorations were guided by two theoretical assumptions of great practical potential. The existence of a navigable, uh, sorry, I've messed up. Yeah, sorry, the existence of a navigable channel around and through the North American continent over Canada. And you can see over here, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, okay, this is, this is the thing. So it's where you see Anyan up there. That's what they were looking for. Yeah, the existence of this Northwest uh, passage, which, if discovered, would break the Hispano-Portuguese hegemony over the southern routes and provide a more direct route to the Far East. And that the other, so these were the two assumptions, this was the first and the second one was that of a southern continent. Terra Australis, an immense tract of land thought to counterbalance the vast masses of the Northern Hemisphere, a fabled source of yet more wealth than the Americas or the Spice Islands of the East Indies. So this was the investment. This is the reason why they were spending so much money and why everyone was rushing to this and why the competition. So this Terra Australis, in fact, and both these in turn gave rise to a number of subsidiary, but nevertheless fundamental questions such as the determination of longitude at sea, victualizing, in other words, you know, sort of providing food and feeding hundreds of sailors that comprised the ship's crews and preventing uh, potentially fatal afflictions like scurvy. Scorbut? No, Escorbut. Escorbut. One more word. <laughs> As such, political, commercial, and scientific and technological considerations loomed equally large and mutually shaped each other. So it is thus quite meaningless to consider these expeditions in any light which excludes any of this triumvirate of interests represented respectively by Western European nations, trading companies, and learned societies. So inside the, the boundaries between the international trading companies, governments and their navies, and learned societies were of, uh, so indeed, these were often fuzzy and interpenetration between these spheres was common, if not, inevitable. So, like for instance, uh, you know, it might surprise you all, but you know, this interlocking of these three interests is also represented when we look at, uh, for instance, um, Sorry, just bear with me for a minute. Yeah, so if you look, for instance, at the fact that trading companies, uh, the big trading corporations, in order just to keep their, their, their fleet afloat, 
needed navigators, needed engineers, needed uh, 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 natural historians, because after all, most of them were trading in, uh, in, in uh, either in spices or else in minerals. Well, even gold and silver, you required, and these were natural historians at that time. I mean, there was no such thing as a mining engineer. So uh, the natural historian looked at both uh, living and dead nature. So these people are central to the workings of these corporations. And there's an in inter interpenetration immediately between uh, the learned societies and trading corporations. So many of uh, the world's big savants, uh, Newton, for instance, he owned a share in the East India Company, which today would be the equivalent of about 40 or 50 million dollars. He lost most of it in speculation, but he was still at the end of the day, he still, when he died in, 17, in 1729, he still had about $10 million in today's worth of shares. Huh? So these were people who were actually invested in the East India Company. Newton himself, at the same time, was the master of the mint in London. In other words, he was the equivalent of, uh, who is the head of the Bank of Mexico, the people who make the money? Uh, you know, I mean, the the national, okay, yeah, okay, but I mean, you know what, <clears throat> so it's, he was, huh? Huh? Okay, so he was, he was Victoria Rodriguez. Okay. And at the same, so he had one foot in the, in the East India Company and another foot in government. So if you remember his law of specific gravity, you know, uh, the specific gravity of metals comes from uh, ways of trying to, uh, to prevent counter counterfeiting of gold coins. That's why you require, I mean, that's how he thinks the thing out. So basically it's a problem of uh, of, econ of economics, which is immediately translated into a problem of physics. Which, that, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's not as if someone is telling him, hey, please produce this law for me. No, no. It is where he is and because of who he is that he can do this sort of thing. You know, he can translate from one to the other. So one must remember that this science, this early modern science, is based basically on. It's, it's, it's predicated on these intricate and inextricable relationships between trading companies, uh, national interest, and learning societies, and learned societies. The three are together. Now, of course, you can immediately say to me, yeah, okay, that holds, that holds for England, and perhaps it holds for the Netherlands as well. But what about France? What about Spain? What about Portugal? Where you don't have independent trading companies. Trading companies and learned societies are both emanations of the state. So in fact, it's the state that has all three within it. And so perhaps, uh, the, the savants do not have the same freedom, but they still have the same articulations. And they work with each other. I mean, you know, they work within this triumvirate. So you cannot separate the triumvirate from the workings of early modern science. And this triumvirate is also what organizes 
what we even call fundamental mathematics, like Euler's law, or the fact that we need logarithmic tables. Now, all this is looked upon as if these people are working in pure mathematics. They are not. In fact, they're working because there are prizes being given in order to determine longitude, latitude. Euler, for instance, when he dies, uh, the Royal Society and uh, the King of England give his widow 10,000 pounds. 10,000 pounds is about 10 million pounds today, 10 million dollars as a prize, because that's what uh, they thought he should be getting for the contribution that he makes towards getting to the Terra Australis <laughs> and the de determination of longitude. So, you know, we think that these people are working in an autonomous world. They are not. They're all working towards prizes. There are lots of incentives to do things pretty much like today. Of course, not like today because we are historians. There are specificities of history. We do not have trading companies today. We do not have learned societies as such. We have universities. We have a completely different thing. But at the same time, there is something which we could call big science. And this big science organizes the other fields. Also, the thing is that many of these people are not disciplinarians. They're working at the same time in physics, but also in, in, math, in mathematics, but also in occult sciences like, like Newton, uh, also working in religion like Newton again. Uh, Newton's most well-read text was not the Principia Mathematica, neither the optics, but it was his chronology of the ancient kingdoms where he uses his his knowledge of physics in order to correct the chronology of the Bible. And this is his, the work that is most widely read in Europe. It's translated into almost every European language within a year of its publication. And everyone is reading this uh, rather than the book which he's now known for, the Principia Mathematica. So, one has to immediately think that it's a different world from our world, huh? on the one hand. And at the same time, there are similarities. So this idea you know, of mode one, mode two, big science, small science, little science, yeah, I mean, it, it is something which is created at a certain time because we forget we have an idea of 19th century science of the way in which disciplines are being made. And we want to look at science, we really in a, in a, in a very politically correct way, that all this is objective, there are, and we keep fighting for it. We must remember amongst ourselves, you know, and against the government, you know, uh, we should not have restrictions on the kind of research that we do. We should be, we should be financed. And I mean, I agree with that. But on the other hand, one must remember that in history, that's not the way in which things work. Whereas we always evoke history, saying that in the past it was like this and we, we want our rights back. No, we might want new rights, but these are not old rights. And it's not as if we want something which was already there in the past. Uh, on the other hand, this accountability is something which is absolutely linked with inextricably linked with the way in which science functioned in the past and still carries on in what we call big science, this accountability. So also one must remember that many of these people uh, who worked for trading companies also founded societies, learned societies. So, you know, they work in, East India company, in the East India Company for 20 years or 30 years, and then after retirement, move to found companies. You know, it's, it's, so the link is really extremely complicated. You know, it's inter, these things are intertwined. Uh, 
<laughs> and as far as the state, you know, so let me now come to the last bit of my talk, uh, where I would like to say that if we think that, you know, in, you know, it's quite meaningless to consider these expeditions in any light which ex excludes any uh, one of this triumvirate of interests. Indeed, the boundaries between the international trading companies, etc. This is what I said. It's they're very fuzzy, and you know, the spheres are very common amongst them. Of course, there are specialities. You know, each in each forum, you're doing different things, but still, you're talking and you're looking at the others, and you you know, it's in permanent communication this world, it's an organic whole. So if I focused on just one example, which is on the Pacific, uh, and uh, on this, you know, these great expeditions, I could have looked at many others. You know, for instance, uh, cosmology, cosmography, astronomy, Uh, sorry. Yeah, hydrography, large-scale geographical surveys, and certain natural history projects like large-scale plantations of translocated crops. Just think of the Caribbean. Just think of Brazil. Of sugarcane and other plantations, which come from elsewhere. But all this is also, I mean, this is big science. It's not easy. You just can't pick up something. You can't pick up sugarcane and plant it here. No, no. There's the whole, as uh, you know, the moment you start looking at the way in which it's all organized, it requires millions and it requires a huge amount of investment of, of thinking about plants, about how they can move, and how labor can be organized and reorganized. So this is also the basis of slavery in a way. You know, it works with, eco with economics. And this is big science. We always have the tendency to look at slave, you know, we look at things from the economic perspective, we look at them from the political perspective, but we forget that there is a scientific component in this and that scientific a component, a component of knowledge which, without which, these big colonial projects cannot function. So for early modernity, this inextricable relationship between science and the state and elite interests have always existed. Knowledge has always mattered to states and economic elites. Most knowledge producers have been attentive to the interests of the states and of their elites. And in fact, it is this which lies at the basis of what we now call state sciences or big sciences. And we tend to forget this when we write the history of science, because the history of science is then based on, you know, an idea of modern science and of, of the scientific revolution. Whereas we forget what the, what the continuities are. And these continuities, let me just give you some idea. This is from here. Uh, this is uh, just above Tsinsunsan. <laughs> so this is the Purepecha administrative headquarters. It is massive. And what is it, basically? It's a complex of astronomical observatories, of calculation, and of taxation. So this is where you know, the whole central bureaucracy of the Pure Pechas is situated. And this, it's high up on top of that. So if you also want an idea of a panopticon, this is a very good place. I mean, you don't have to wait for Foucault to invent it. It was already there in their minds. And it's a way of organizing and administering 
a society. And this does not work without big science. I mean, of this type. You know, the state is involved with this. There are all kinds of bureaucrats. There are all kinds of, you know, people in, um, sort of, you know, specialized in astronomical and astrological uh, observation and calculation. Because the taxation, when crops are to be cut, what has to happen, everything is organized around this. The calendar is organized around this. And the calendar means the state and its income. So this is just one example. Another one is the Ulubeg Observatory in Samarkand, 13th century. Now, this is exceedingly important for the Islamic empires. Why? Because most of them are nomadic empires. They don't have fixed uh, uh, capitals. They're nomadic. And they always require ways of determining where you are with respect to Mecca on the one hand, but also with respect to the various trading posts. And all that is determined astronomically. So the tables that come out of this from the 13th century are still more or less, you know, I mean, you can still calculate with them. But so it's not so much the science behind it, but the fact that all these things are actually linked together and made to work together. Another example, this is a, a gnomon from the Inca Empire. Again, the Incas work on exactly the same thing because this is for the eclipses and for the equinoxes. Uh, you can calculate with this and they've actually been able to rework how the procedure, what procedures were used in order to be able to calculate uh, using astronomical observations and shadows. And of course, I mean, so these, so I do want to bring, you know, into our minds the fact that no empire, no state anywhere, I, I'm not even going to go into the Chinese case about which so much has been written, you know, I mean, the history of Chinese science is just replete with this. With the fact that these are bureaucracies, and the bureaucracy means the state. And it's 2000, I mean, you know, it's 2000 years old, their state. Which doesn't, of course, mean that they're, you know, I mean, I'm not talking about how old the science is. I'm talking about this link, this articulation, that no state can function without this. And to think that states don't have knowledge and without and and they, you can think of them just as uh, you know as economic and social entities you you have to put in this knowledge into them reinvest them with knowledge now a lot of you know recent work has been coming out as well so for instance there's this book by monica azzolini called the duke and the stars so it's about astrology and Politics in Renaissance Milan. So this is the 14th century and the role of astrology, not of astronomy, but of astrology, because it was through astrology that they could actually determine the right time, the most uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Gosh, you know, when something, when you have good omens to do things, and the world works this way. Blessing. Like a blessing, exactly. Yeah. And when not to do certain things also. When not to go to war, when to go to war, etc., etc. And all this is also linked to, uh, to revenues and to the income and to the economy of the state. So, you know, we think that astrology is some sort of magic. No, I mean, it has deep links with the workings of states at the same time. And it's not as if you find this in some way out exotic places. This is the heart of Europe. And people are now beginning to look at this. You know, this, this is a new and upcoming field in the history of science as to what these links are and what. So we don't want to uh, define things by saying, oh, 
you know, this is good science, this is bad science. No, we want to first and foremost understand what, what is their logic, what are they trying to do, and how these things fit into those logics. Uh, a very interesting thesis, which unfortunately was never presented, was never published by Alison Sandman. It's called Cosmographers versus Pilots, Navigation, Cosmography, and the State in Early Modern Spain. And this is all about the role of cosmography in the, conque in the conquest of the Americas. Yeah. Uh, it's an exceedingly interesting thesis. Unfortunately, she, uh, she published three chapters from it you can find in collected, uh, you know, in edited volumes, but never a thesis. I have it if anyone wants it. Uh, yeah, I can, I can let you uh, look at it. Another book, which is about here, and it's called The Mapping of New Spain, Indigenous Cartography and the Maps of the Relaciones Geographicas. And over here, you see how, what the, uh, the states, you know, the, the empires and states of uh, Mesoamerica, which now is called Mexico, but all the different states and how this, how they were, how they were managing space and how the space management then got translated into the, uh, the geographical maps of the 1570s. You know, uh, and it's a very, very, very careful study of the links between not so much just epistemology, but also who were the people who were doing it, what were these bureaucrats of these, uh, you know, of the indigenous states and how they functioned and how these could easily be translated from one to the other. So by, I mean, so this also tells us that it, it gives us a hint as to the success of empires meeting with each other, you know? So when conquest, in some cases, like in North America, it's a disaster. But the moment you have a state which meets another state, something else happens. Because these states have very similar, no matter where they are, you might have wheels, you might not have wheels, you live in, a, you know, in another world, but a state is a state. There are certain fundamentals, and these fundamentals work on this notion of big science. So although these people never theorized on it, you know, they didn't know, they weren't talking about big science and small science, but what, what they were doing was precisely the fact that you can communicate, that you can cooperate. Although there's competition, although there is asymmetries between empires, one is conquering the other, but the structures of an empire, the fundamental structures still remain. So all this goes to show that, you know, little science that is academic, disciplinary, autonomous is in fact a historical anomaly, if not a myth. And the reason why I wanted to talk to you about this today was precisely to bring up what we still have, where the continuities. Of course, there are disjunctures. We are not living at 2000 years ago, we are living in today's world with today's uh, organizations with today's geopolitics, with today's politics, and with today's technologies and material cultures. But there is something which there, of which there's a continuity, which is this relationship between, between forms of knowledge and state interests and elite interests, which finally is what big science is about. And of course, the sums of money that are invested in this. These are not small sums of money. You know, it's not as if these are small things that someone would go and do, hey, go and, you know, get me this or that or the other. No, no, I mean, this is really fundamental to the running of the state and requires a lot of investment. And it's only come back in a big way in the 20th century, again, in a new form which makes historians of science then look at all this and say, hey, you know what's happening here. So I'll stop there.
Daniel. Ah. Ah. Uh, good evening and thank you for your talk. And I remembered a work published by Stephen J. Harris. I don't know if it's yes, it. yes, uh, on the Jesuits. Yeah, of course. I remember uh, that article, well, this yeah. work, because I will remember long distance corporations, uh, how Compañía de Jesús or Casa de Contratación de Sevilla has a similar work. They, they need to, to have uh, communications, they uh, have natural historians, they have, uh, I don't know, a lot of people uh, in these works. So I, of course, I remember uh, this work with your talk and yeah, uh, and I think that it is quite, uh, I don't know how to say it. I was very interested in what you said about, this is not about tracing how uh, ancient science is. Instead, it's about finding those links, finding how uh, there is a need for, there are needs for, for knowledge uh, to the nations, to the states. And I, I no, a question, no, but it's, it's quite that. Uh, well, I was very interested in you pointed out this, this, this topic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Thanks. I don't have a question right okay. now, but. Yeah. Okay. I, I just want to say something to what uh, to react to what you said. Uh, I did not talk about uh, religion in this. I could have. I mean, I think, and I should have. In fact, uh, in a way, that's also because of my own allergy to religion. That I, you know, sometimes it's like you, like an ostrich. You, you know, you put your head in the sand. Of course, I know uh, uh, Harris's work. Stephen Harris's work really well. And I find it very interesting because in fact, what he does is <clears throat> he places the Jesuits <clears throat> in exactly this logic. Uh, but what he does, of course, what he doesn't do is then try and show the links between the Jesuits and uh, these other groups of scientists. He's looking at Jesuits because he himself is a Jesuit. And his work is basically to dislodge this idea that these people are, you know, anything else. They also belong to this world. Yeah. Yeah. My turn. Uh, Kapil, so I, I have two main points, like larger points, and a few smaller points that maybe I can tell you about later. So the, the, the two main points are, are these. Uh, I think that your notion of continuity in the way that you exposed it uh, is a bit problematic because okay. continuity might not mean the same as the repetition of the conditions for the reappearance of something. In a way, I think that some of your examples and even your interpretation would be. Uh, Better, I mean, the, the term re reappearance would suit a bit better than uh, continuity because continuity in, in many, you know, uh, disciplines yeah. means a common origin and, and that something is, you know, transmitted, whatever this could mean. We could discuss about that yeah. also. And I, I just think that at, at the you know, at the level of the analysis of the terminology that you are using to convey the interpretation, maybe continuity is not the best term. Would you like to respond? I to would this? like to respond and to then, that immediately. I completely okay. agree with you uh, in that what I was meaning was a, a basic structural continuity. You know, it's like 
as if no matter what society you go to, there are certain structures which are more or less unchanged. Mm -hmm. You know, structures, say for instance, relationships between uh, mother and child, so, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the sort of thing that I meant by continuity. But what, but I take your point that what I should have said was there are always reconfigurations of this. For me, the continuity is something which is, which underlies the, uh, the organization of a state. That's what I meant, you know, and its yeah. relationship to knowledge. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's, I mean, so sorry. I mean, no. there, there was a confusion over here. I, I take I take your point that it should not have used the word continuity, but what I meant was by that that there are unchanging uh, structural relationships between <coughs> different organs. How that is organized is not a continuity at all. Okay. Then there are reconfigurations, and these are historical and conjunctural. Right. So I mean, you cannot certainly you cannot do even a teleological history of this or anything of the sort. These are these are different relationships yeah. at different times. That's yeah. okay. And I take your point perfectly. Okay. Yeah. So I, it's good that you've said that you're not thinking in teleological terms. No. However, however, it's what, what I think it's very, very interesting about your proposal is that the, the, the thesis, the main thesis <laughs> that you have presented today doesn't sound too much the, the work of a historian of science in more traditional term, but you, you're, you're going a bit farther into the, you know, the realm of kind of a, 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 a theoretical uh, approach to history and, and, and anthropology in, in comparative terms. I, I will explain what I mean to, to say. So because, uh, you know that, in, for instance, in, in, in anthropology and related sciences, for a number of years, there have been this discussion about uh, a diversity of ontologies, right? Yeah. That different peoples in, in the earth have. No? So you have in France, Philippe Descola talking about these four modes of the relationship between nature and culture and so on and so forth. No? So that, that discussion seems to suggest that people in different places of the world have done things differently yeah. and that it is very uh, difficult that you could reach the same ending points. For instance, when it comes to the relation between nation states and societies, the triumvirate as you described. Yeah. So you seem to be suggesting that this is actually not the case, especially when you look at things related to science. Yeah. So, then you, you see my point, no? You, the, this, this thesis goes beyond the, the boundaries of history of science. This actually enters into a debate with many things that are currently being said in many different disciplines, especially in the social sciences. So I, I can see that you realize this. So, so what, what, what do you think about that? I mean, are you, are you prepared to discuss, with all, to debate with all these other people and yeah. Or, well, or what are the implications in a, yeah. in a larger scale of, of what you have presented? Yeah, okay. Well, thanks for that. Because, I mean, that goes to the heart of why I want to talk about this in the first place. Uh, the one thing that wasn't said when Erica presented me, you know, introduced me here, uh, which is that I am basically a micro historian. I work on cases. And I try and, you know, sort of pull them apart to try and see what their links with. So a case might be a case, but what is the local? The local itself is composed of circulations, of negotiations of all kinds. And that's what I'm trying to look at, trying to place something. And that's one of the reasons I called my book Relocating Modern Science. I mean, there is a location somewhere, and that location is. But that location doesn't mean that it's isolated from the rest of the world. So in a way, there was a tension, there is a tension in my own work between the local and the larger environment, especially since I work on uh, knowledge making in, uh, you know, after 
uh, European expansion. So in the age of in the, in the age of European empires, to show that this knowledge was not just being made in uh, in Europe. Mm. Something that I could have gone on about over here was that even in these, even in the specific discovery, places like Jakarta, like um, like uh, the Cape of Good Hope, etc., do not play just a role of you know, sort of repairing ships. They be uh, crews are being revi uh, revi uh, sort of you know revamped over here. They're being replaced because people die. At each port of call, there is a forty percent replacement of the crew because forty percent of the people have died or have to be taken off board. So it is the knowledges of all these different communities that comes together in the making of this world. And a lot of indigenous knowledge moves around in this. So this is what, I mean, I was looking at it from the meeting point of India and Europe, but again, localized. The problem is that at the same time, there is something called global history which tends to just look at the world as if there's no situation, as if everything can be accounted for in a kind of a free flow. And there is tensions with that against also this tension of difference, mm -hmm. which is what all of the social sciences and anthropology are about. I'm a social scientist myself, and that's why I'm situated. Mm -hmm. And the word situation is not an empty word. Right. Okay. So it is. In fact, that tension, which made me look at this problematic, to see what there is. I mean, what, is, what are the conditions of the possibility of encounter? There's something underlying the fact that two people can actually, their practices can translate one into the other, which means that within society, there are certain structures, there are certain things which, no matter who you are, where you come from, you recognize. So just to insist on one point, is there a cognitivist aspect to your thesis or not really? There is. There is. Okay. There is. Of course, there's a cognitive aspect to this. Yeah. And then, of course, I also, huh? Exactly. Yeah, it, exactly. I didn't go into it. Exactly. Exactly, 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 exactly. I mean, there is a cognitive aspect to that. And that in a way for me was also, uh, I, I was inspired a lot because in the late 1990s, when I was looking at, you know, that's how I started looking into this, was that I came into contact with two big historians of the, of the encounter between uh, Europe and the rest of the world. One looking at Europe and the East, and the other one looking at Europe and the West. Europe and the West is Serge Brzezinski. Yeah. yeah? Exactly. And uh, to the East is Sanjay Subramaniam. And they both had the same kind of idea, which is that there are connected histories. Now, they use the word connected history, whereas I'm an historian of science, and I'm, I come from philosophy of science. And for me, there was a cognitive aspect to this which they didn't look at. They were looking at political structures. They were looking at a number of other structures. They were not looking at this side. And it was reading them that inspired me actually to say, you know, there's something else happening over here at the same time, which we do, which we ignore. Historians always ignore science and science always ignores history, <laughs> usually. And when you bring the two together, especially with this other form of relational history, these new relational histories, was what inspired me to do this. And also all this talk about, you know, ah, we are in big science and before that there was little science and then, you know, everyone was nice and free and we were doing our own thing. And now, you know, the government uh, has come up and, you know, sort of wants to dominate. And I, as I said, I'm politically for that position, but I cannot say that I'm historically, but I mean, I cannot give you a historical, uh, Basis for that. 
Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that, that's another question. Again, you know, people say that modern science owes its existence to cap uh, to the rise of capitalism, and I say, uh -huh, careful. Uh, thank you, Kapil. Uh, my question is, uh, you already answered, but uh, if we see these whole um, scientific practices and their dynamics with politic uh, practices, economic practices, um, for instance, uh, the trading companies and bureaucracy, can we say that we are already uh, study the history of capitalism, the history of big science as a history of capitalism in the modern period, 16th from 18th century? It is linked to capitalism because I'm talking about trading companies, okay? But, you know, if you were to look at any of the Meso-American uh, empires, or even the South American empires, the Inca, for instance, etc. You see that uh, much of this activity, which I which I did not mention over here and which I should have, is about metrology, weights and measures, and the translation of one set of weights and measures to another. And this forms the basis again of material exchange. And it forms the basis of value. So while I'm not talking about, I mean, capitalism is one form of material exchange. And in early modernity, it's really important. That's why I talked about it. But you can translate this into other forms which are not capitalist. On the other hand, which still require material exchange. Because by capitalism, we mean a certain form of material exchange and a certain form of capital and of its accumulation and of the logics of the production of that capital. How is it produced? On what basis? And how is it? how does it accumulate? And how is it distributed, redistributed or not? That is the question for in the capitalist world, whereas what we are looking at is other forms also the same thing, but which are non-capitalist, but where the logics, in fact, I mean, there's a material logic. If you, you know, even if you don't have money, you're exchanging one thing against another, so you have the idea of value. Uh, you know, I, in, in 2007, this is just a little anecdote. I was in Peru. And uh, I was really in the, uh, you know, the Altiplana, high, high mountains. It was about 4,000 meters. And there was a little market over there. And this little market had, of course, I mean, there was one or two people who had lots of wares that they brought in from the city. But there was lots of local produce. So there was one woman with 20 little potatoes and another one with three avocados and yet another one with a little piece of chicken. And they were sitting around. People were either coming and giving, you know, they offered them money, but I waited, I, I, I sat there for about four hours watching what was happening. And what was happening was that, you know, one with, with 20 potatoes wanted to exchange six potatoes with one avocado. And then there was this whole exchange about the value of, the relative value of things. And then finally, she gave five potatoes, but there was, you know, there was money at the same time being exchanged. So it was, you know, it was a strange sort of system, but still, I mean, this is an exchange. It's a material exchange, and you have to determine value somewhere. So, I mean, there is, I mean, in that sense, there is, you know, there is some there is material exchange, but I'm, I'm, in this case, I was looking, yes, of course, I mean, I'm looking at capitalism because I was talking about the early modern world. But if you want to look at other societies, if you want to do other things, then you have to think beyond that and go behind what the notion of capital is about.
Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, given that you have uh, presented us a lot of evidence that science itself has been always linked to economic development, to trade, uh, and some kind of uh, distinction between this kind of science, which is consistent, let's say, in many different times. I'm curious about what do you think about a history, let's say, of more autonomous science, but before what we think is the uh, starting point of autonomous science. No? Let's say maybe if you think it would be important to study um, episodes of um, let's say, people that produce knowledge, and this knowledge being in some kind like, um, let's say, like um, addressing some kind of uh, danger towards political power in the, at that time. Because usually the image that we have of Autonomous science maybe is related to, I don't know, like uh, uh, Copernicus or Galileo against the church and so on. And it's very, very linked to uh, the European history and also the idea yeah. of scientific revolution. So what before? Uh, can we also find examples of this autonomous science? So as we find of non-autonomous science. I'm sure we can find examples of autonomous science as well. I'm not, I don't want to pit one against the other. Huh? It wasn't as if there's autonomous science and there's big science. That is the way in which it's being actually looked at. Okay. Yes. All I'm saying is that the, it, big science is not today's invention. Okay. It's not a creation. It's not a recent creation. It's always been there which does not mean that it is the only form of knowledge making. I mean, I do not, I'm not exclusionary over here. I'm not saying that nothing else counts. All I'm saying is that this has a history. I'm looking at big science. My title was Big Science and the Early Modern World. I'm not saying that, you know, nothing else existed. Everything was, uh, you know, is, can be reduced. So this is not a reductionist argument at all. This argument is actually pleading for one part, which, in fact, we tend to occlude. You know, this is a 20th century invention. It comes up after, after the Second World War, when the state suddenly, you know, lays its hands on, on science. And so, you know, there's a politi political recuperation. No, I mean, I don't, I don't think that this is the 20th century question at all. Which does not mean that there are that there's been nothing else ever, and that people haven't been thinking for themselves, and you know, I mean, uh, that everything happens within uh, some form of state structure. No, 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 no. I mean, I mean, and thanks for asking that question because if ever there was any doubt about it, I would like that clear. That I am not pleading for this, but I am also pleading for something else, which is. That these links, I mean, it's not as if these are completely separate worlds either. There is a porosity between them, you know. You can be thinking by yourself, but you can also be uh, inspired by what's happening in, uh, in a more organized space as well. You know, these are not isolates. Yeah, that's, that's all I'm also trying to say, that there's more to it that you know, there might be this organized science and there might be individuals who are practicing on their own, but these individuals are not practicing in vacuum either. And nor are the others practicing only within a state logic. You also have, you know, you can also be thinking for yourself. You can also be uh, at the same time passionately involved in something else. And, uh, but you can also feed on what's going on and you know you get an idea because something else is happening elsewhere and then you build on it yeah i mean there's it's it's a much more complex world i do not want the i mean i'm not looking at binaries the way in which the thing has been presented little science big science mode 1 mode 2 yeah thank you kapil so i i would like to take on 
what you were saying just now. So as a phenomenon, this uh, big science uh, is not, uh, I don't know, a property of the 20th uh, century science. But as a concept, I mean, as a label, could you, I don't know, maybe, um, how do you say, elaborate on the logic behind the, the push forward of the concept as a, I don't know, maybe as a, a legit, legitimization um, tool for uh, the hegemony of the United States after, I mean, the, during the Cold yeah. War? Well, it's before the Cold War. In fact, it has to do with Los, Los Alamos and the Manhattan Project. This is where the whole thing comes from. I mean, and they make no bones about it. You know, that's, that's the history. So it's basically a US idea that suddenly the state comes in because before that, what you see is that much of the science, which is still linked to the state, is being done by universities. And even today, a lot of uh, US science uh, in the US is still farmed out to universities. Universities work on military contracts. And they always have, they worked on all kinds of contracts from all kinds of people. But there were never these big organized laboratories. Yeah, but I mean, as a concept. So concept. this is, no, the concept, the concept comes from, that's what I'm saying. It's conceptualized in the United States from there, from Los Alamos and the Manhattan Project. And then from the Cold War, because then what you suddenly find is immediately after that, you have, uh, uh, the Vaniva Bush report, Science, the Endless Frontier. And there is something called science policy for the first time. Huh? So you have a document, you have money being given from the state, a portion for this, which was not the case previously, although the state was giving a lot of money. It's not that the state is giving more money now, it was only, it was a far looser system. And this is what got these people up, you know, and saying, yeah, and this is what this, uh, you know, big science is about. And then Eisenhower at the same time, while this is happening, uses this term, the military industrial complex. So these things come together and this is what then gets thematized as big science. But once it's thematized, okay, there's a specificity to this thematization, but once it gets thematized, it's a, it's a concept. And then we can say, does it, is this the only history that we can give it? Yeah. Can't we look at it yeah, as, yeah. as a phenomenon inside of uh, organized state, state-run societies? Be they uh, here or, you know, I mean, older, older societies here or in Asia or even in Africa. Because Africans also had states. Yeah, and how do those states run? And, you know, I mean, one has to then look at this. But I'm just sort of posing this. I'm trying to, in a way, uh, be provocative and say, okay, you know, here's, here's a concept. And here, if you want to look at this concept, then you have to also see all these things. And, of course, these links exist, not in the same way. It's true that there is a historical conjuncture. And what happened then is not, I mean, what happened now, what happens now cannot have happened, you know, a hundred years before that. It won't have, what happened in the 1950s will not happen today. Again, the world is changing and every time we have new conjunctures, but concepts exist. And then you can do things with these concepts. And where I talked about continuity is precisely that if you look at the concept, then you can look at certain, con you know, there are continuities. Otherwise, you know, there are ruptures all the time and then you can't use the same concept at all. That's, that's what I meant. I mean, the deep continuities that form the condition for the possibility of talking about the past. You know, there's a very nice sentence from a very famous sentence from a book called The Go-Between, which starts with this sentence. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. And I always tell my students, this is a very important sentence. You have to know this and you have to internalize this. But there's a big but over here, 
which is that they might do things differently, but not so differently that you cannot recognize. Them. Otherwise, there's no studying the past at all. There's no possibility for studying the past if things are so different. If it's like going to Mars or to another planet or to another, I don't know, to another form of life. You don't know anything about that. Yeah, I yeah. have two questions from yeah. the audience. Ah. So one is if some characteristics of big science are cooperation, competition, and greater funding, often from states or merchant entities, does this mean that at the times it can happen, there has been a reduction in the number of areas of research? No, there are certain areas of research on which you focus then. Yes, of course, this money is for that. Which again, it answer it goes back to that question. It is not exclusive. That doesn't mean that other people can't work. No, it's just you know I'm, I might be interested in uh, in something. So I say, okay, you know, I have a prize. If you can do this, then uh, I'll give you so much money. Which doesn't mean that that uh, you know you won't be doing other things. Some people will be attracted to this money. And yes, I mean it's a way of it's a way of organizing. But not a monopoly. It's not. It doesn't monopolize and doesn't exclude. We are all interested in something more than others, and we prefer, for instance, to invest here rather than there. But if you don't invest there, that doesn't mean that you can't work there. Um, yeah, I have another one. Yeah, yeah. But I think the the audience, or maybe there is a confusion about this false dichotomy on big science, little science. Yeah. Um, but it says before big science, there were many isolated researchers in their niche fields, as opposed to fewer fields of broader interest. Yeah, no, but the thing is that all this coexists. I'm not, I, all I'm trying to say is, it's not that everything is big science against small science. All I'm saying is that big science has a longer history than 75 years. A much longer history than 75 years. Okay. okay. Which doesn't mean that little science has, you know, there's no such thing as little science, that, you know, because little science, of course, has a long history. And then comes big science and there's, you know, and then everyone is left without any money, which, which is unfortunately our case today. Where if you if you don't if you're not in a big project then you don't have even you don't have money to exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of us have have uh, good jobs and so we have job security and so we can do what we can do. But for the younger generations, for instance, if they cannot get a research grant, they cannot have a career. So right. So I mean, it is the case today, and this this we have to fight against. And that, that's where this, yes, I mean, there is today, we have to admit to the fact and recognize the fact that these are becoming exclusive. Okay. That big science is becoming exclusive uh, to the detriment of other forms of knowledge making. Yeah. Uh, no, no. Diana. <laughs> Well, the teacher who left, he said he was asking the, um, if you could answer the, about little science and what could be the future of this little science. Yeah, I mean that's the question for me. I mean that's a, uh, that that is an alarming question. What is the future of little science? Because today, big science is pushing little science out of the way in the sense that you don't get a job for it. It's not that you can't do it. Of course, you can. I mean, if you have the money. And if you have the means, the only thing is that we require money and we require means and we require a space of independence and autonomy. And the way in which big science has now come to dominate, this is a problem. So I admit, I mean, I'm, that's exactly the point that I'm trying to make is not that we've always had this so good, you know, uh, where, where's the problem? The world's always been the same. No, the world has not always been the same. Uh, 
There has been big science in the past. The only thing is that today it's eating up uh, all the resources and we have nothing left to feed people with. I mean, you can't do little science if you, if you don't have a job. How do you do it? You don't have money, exactly. So maybe it's a false problem that I raise. <laughs> um, thank you, teacher. Thank you, Professor. Um, so my, qu my question is, well, you mentioned that colonial powers needed science. And if we extrapolate that to the current state of, of things, we could say that science is profitable for companies and that its very existence depends on the economy of the state. So would you say that it's, is it possible to consider science or big science as an institution apart from the state, either equal or subordinated to it, but independent, or as part of the state? Big science. Yeah. Well, I don't think, you know, I mean, I, I, I do think that there are, there are autonomies in the sense that science cannot just be part of the state. You know, I'm not, uh, again, this would be reductionist. It's as if the state does every, no, no. I mean, there, there are knowledge making activities and there are articulations of these with the rest. So this is not as if this is one state department, you know, which is working on this where someone tells you, okay, this is the state policy. We, we've decided this in parliament and then you execute it. No, no. These are negotiations that are taking place. Uh, there's a fundamental problem today, which is that uh, if, you, if you don't fit into any of these large projects, then you don't have a place. Why do you think there's no good science and bad science? I think different people has different point of view of the same topic, different countries, and even in the same country, many persons don't don't have the same point of view. Why? What do you think about that? Okay, so that's a question of judging knowledge. Okay, whether whether you think something is a, is good science or bad science, or whether they should be doing it or not, I think those are those are questions that we have as citizens. Huh? I would like us to be doing more work, say, for instance, on social medicine. Uh, there's lots of work to be done, for instance, on women's medicine. You know, very little is invested in that. Uh, take, for instance, the case of, of uh, the difference, you know, in, in contraception, for instance, in contraceptive research, a lot of work is done on male contraception, but very little. And women are looked upon very differently. More needs to be invested in that. Now, I'm not going to judge the quality of the research being done in this place or that. But as a citizen, I can have demands. No, no, I can have demands. Huh? Okay, And I think that a lot, a lot of work is, I mean, a lot of money is being wasted on going to the moon or going to Mars or going to Venus or whatever. And that money should be better spent doing other forms of research. But that's my uh, preference as a citizen. As a historian or as a social scientist, I can't judge what other people are doing. I mean, uh, otherwise, then someone would be judging, hey, you can't do this. What, what are you saying over here? You know, I don't want this. Uh, I have the freedom to say what I like and I have the freedom to do what I like. But I think that if the state is going to spend money on things, if, if money is going to be apportioned for certain things, that has to also has to take into account uh, you know, citizens' rights, citizens' demands, gender rights, uh, and treating men and women equally, treating 
uh, different races equally, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, treating children uh, uh, not as not as uh, as uh, you know half wits, but as as uh, as human beings, etc., etc., etc. So I have my vision, but you might have your own, and we can have different demands, and that is the world of the public space where we have to discuss these things. But you cannot, because of that, then go into the laboratory and say, no, no, you can't do this or that or the other. No. That's a different question. Thank you, Kapil. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, I, I think our time is um, oh. up. So uh, well, we really want to thank your time and your interest in well, our thank questions. You. <laughs> yeah, OK, so thank you. Well, thank you all. And thank you for your questions. Gracias a todos por su presencia. Espero que hayan disfrutado la charla y los invitamos a asistir a otras de las conferencias que eh, tenemos preparadas en el seminario SUFESIM. Gracias. Buena tarde. <risa>